Buongiorno, tutto bene? Sì. Happy Monday, welcome back. Today we are going to discuss the narrative, the plot, the story and the themes in the first road movie of the class. It happened one night, directed by an Italian director, someone who was born in Palermo, Sicily, and christened with the name of Francesco Rosario Capra. Not a very aristocratic sounding name because Capra in Italian means, anyone? Goat, a peasant name, right? A rural name. I'm going to go through a series of frames from the film, and you find all of them inside this PDF, which was embedded in the page. But if you access the page from a phone, you'll just see a link, and you can download that if you want to, watch it in your browser, etc. Maybe I'll be able to finish this overview of the film and its themes, the treatment of the characters. Today, maybe I'll need some time on Friday, on Wednesday, sorry. Wednesday, I will also talk about the visual style a little bit of this film. And I will talk more on Wednesday about the first assignment, which is due on Friday, at the end of Friday this week. However, you find plenty of notes. Use those notes, review them before you do the assignment. Let me just show you, if you go to the end of week one, that's where you find the assignments for that are due this Friday, and that's where you find the description of the viewing notes, the short description from the syllabus, but then a series of detailed, specific prompts, which I dubbed the matrix when I talked about it during the first class last week. I've made some other small changes. You can find them also in the announcements, but I just want to direct your attention to the fact that since we talked about the in a lonely place and saw a sequence to study the use of the body, the placement in the scene, what, how you deliberately and selectively use your body while acting in a traditional film, I provided the whole sequence taking frames every two seconds with the computer, put everything in a PDF, which you can also download. And as it will often be the case, since the PDFs uh, are, are stored in Google Drive to avoid any copyright issues with this or more recent films, you will need to log in into Stony Brook, right? This is the Stony Brook Google Drive in order to see the PDF. I also added, if you go to the announcements, a link to a YouTube video to give you a sense of how different acting styles can interpret the use of the body in a scene. And in particular, among so many examples I could have used, I picked another road movie, but one that will not be treated in this class, which is the Peanut Butter Falcon with Shia LaBeouf and Dakota Johnson, and in that scene, you can see how Shia acts differently, not by the traditional canon, both because it is his personal style, or was at that time, and also because it conforms, it tells something about the character. Whereas Dakota Johnson enters into the shop very slowly, very deliberately, she takes her position in the scene, and holds that position until her character has to move. And pretty much the secondary character that is also in the scene, the shop owner, 
does the same, holding his position and holding as still as necessary behind the counter of the shop. Okay? Just so that you have a better idea. I'm going to use the PDF like this to talk about the film and as I said it's a selection of about 200 frames with captions that give you, gives you a sense of all the important steps in the story in the development of the characters but it's almost entirely a selection focusing on the main characters the man and the woman Peter and Ellie the journalist and the American Harris, the, American, the daughter of an American millionaire. So there are many other scenes that build up the story where you see the father, you see the detectives that the father has unleashed to find her daughter after she's on the run, but they're not included here because this is what we are focusing on, these elements, all the elements that make a road movie. And in many ways, according to many scholars, this is the first properly defined road movies. All the elements can be caught by looking at these frames. The title is, it happened one night. The names of the main actors are on the initial credit together with the title because they were both big stars, Clark Gable and Claudette Colbert. They both won the Oscar as Best Actor, Best Actress for this film. In fact, this film was the first one in the history of the Academy Awards to win the five most important Oscars. Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, Best Actress, Best Screenplay. Of course, adapted screenplay because this is based on a short novel that appeared in Cosmopolitan, the magazine, the monthly magazine, on in August of 1933. The movie was shot at the end. It, it was finished by December of 1933, came out in February 1934. Frank Capra, as I said, is the director. The same way that Frank Capra was born in Italy and left with his family around the age of six, to go and live the American dream. And it's interesting how his biography illuminates the limitations intrinsic to the realization of the American dream. Because he came to the States, the first one in his family to graduate with a degree in chemical engineering. And yet after the university, he was the only one in his family without a job. All the others have the kind of job you would have expected Italian-Americans to have, and probably there was some discrimination at work in there in his state of unemployment. It is true that he also suffered from health issues, psychological issues, and by the 1920s, he did some experimenting with silent films and then pretty much conned his way into the business by being able to talk, a good talk, and, and present himself as a director and a producer with experience, when in fact his experience was minimal, but he was able to shoot his first real film in 1927 with Claudette Colbert as the actress. That film has not survived, was not a success, was a failure in fact. By 1931 he had a good uh, film by 1935, at the 1935 Oscar, by 1934 he had a film that uh, uh, celebrated him, placed him at the attention of Hollywood in a very big way. So, as I said, in the same way that Frank Capra was born in, the, in Italy, moved to the U.S. as a kid and became an American director, essentially, Claudette Colbert was born only about six years later. They were all about the same age. They're all in, the, in their 30s. And Claudette 
moved out of the Channel Islands of France. Channel Islands is important because his family was already bilingual, English and French, into the United States. I think she was three when she got to the United States and, and became an actress and, and, and a good and a big name. When she shot this movie, she was working for big studios. And in fact, by the end of the shooting, which lasted only four or five weeks, she left the set before the conclusion, before the final scene, and you don't see her in the final scene of the movie. Of course, movies tended to be shot sequentially. At that time, Clark Gable was only a couple of years older than Claudette Colbert, and it three or four years younger than Capra. He was American, born in Ohio, I think. And it was kind of the George Clooney of his time, right? That kind of actor. Keep in mind that this is not just a comedy. By definition, by Hollywood genres, this is a screwball comedy. And you can go, even if you go on Wikipedia, you find a good enough definition, like the notes taken by a good student in a cinema studies class. But basically what we have here is the farcical, the satirical representation of romantic love. So we can say a lot, and we will, about gender, about gender roles, gender dynamics in this film. However, keep in mind that there is a lot of irony that quite often the film is playing with you. The, the, the director is playing with you, playing games. That is to say, sending you in a direction, but with irony that subverts that indication, right? Still, to complicate this further, Frank Capra had a certain view of life inspired by traditional values. And in fact, you may know him from uh, his post-war film, Life is a Wonderful Thing, which wasn't a big hit at the box office and came around the time his career in Hollywood was, was fizzling. And then he himself in the 1950s practically stopped doing movies accusing Hollywood of being corrupt, of being morally corrupt. And so, as I said, Capra v being Capra, all his films are capricious because they, he, he twists things a lot. He's trying to be subtle, playing games. But there is also this kind of feel-good vibe. There is some moral lesson, OK? But again, be careful to distinguish the moment where the film is playing with the tropes of conventional gender roles, just playing, just providing a parody of that, and the moments when the film wants to instill some values. Okay? Keep that in mind very much. So, Riskin wrote the screenplay, and he was working with Capra through the 1930s, between 1931 and 1938. They did eight movies together. And if you go to the website, it's not a required reading, but you can find excerpts or the whole uh, short story, the old novella uh, written by Samuel Hopkins Adams' uh, uh, Night Bus that inspired the film, okay, keep that in mind. The first sequence is the setup of the story, right? And it sounds obvious to us, but Capra is one of the founders of the movie industry in Hollywood. So this is a masterpiece of a setup where in a couple of minutes, all the basic elements of the story are visually and also with lines introduced to the viewers. So we find this yacht, 
And a movie like this, every second, every frame is important. So if you blink, you might not see that the name of the yacht, and of course this is a screen capture, so it's, it's not the highest possible resolution, but the name of the yacht is Ellie, which is the nickname of the female protagonist played by Colbert. It is owned by her father, Mr. Andrews, who is a millionaire, right? Big guy. So we're talking about American aristocracy. She's like a princess. And this situation, the yacht, represents visually and through the what is called the mise-en-scene, the choice of the set, the choice of the scene, the main qualities of the characters. That is to say, it's a place secluded from society, right? She's an aristocrat. She doesn't mingle with people. She has no experience of the real world. She lives separate from society. It is a place with a clear hierarchy, right? You find sailors who respond to a captain's orders, and the captain responds to the orders of the owner of the yacht who's on board, Mr. Andrews. And you find waitress and waiters who are tending to the rich guests and therefore also have a subordinate role. And at the very center, you have Ellie. And Ellie cannot be controlled. She's a rebel. She doesn't respond to authority. So you find the father, the captain, and the father is saying, how long has this been going on? She's on a hunger strike. And in a moment, we'll understand why. And she refuses to, to eat. So the captain, who's the one of the authorities, the second highest level of authority on, the bo on board the ship, on board the yacht, cannot do anything about it. The father will make an attempt, no success there either, okay? So we know that the, the female protagonist is isolated from society, lives a life where she is in control in a capricious way. She's basically, as the film lines will call her multiple times, basically she is a spoiled brat. And of course, like in any other road movies, road movie, the road, being on the road, will teach her a lesson, right? And will transform her into a more mature woman. So the father goes down to her cabin and he says, you know, I'll have my way. Meaning you have to obey me, but <laughs> no success. Big failure there. Right? He cannot control her. And what's happened is the following. As part of the setup, you're quickly introduced to the story before the story. The story before the story is that she's 21. She ran away. She ran away from her bodyguards. Because she's rich. She has bodyguards. She goes to a shopping mall, to, to some kind of shop, runs away, finds, meets by chance, gets on a car with an aviator. The aviator is the stereotypical romantic hero of the time, right? Defying death uh, by, by doing acrobatics on, on a plane, etc. And this man is older than she is. She's not really in love, but he's shrewd enough to understand that she is rich, right? That uh, if he marries her, he will become rich. His name, his last name is King. And they, they have married. So they went in front of a justice of peace for a uh, secular marriage. But right after they were married, the uh, bodyguards sent by his father, by her father, took her away and took her to this ship. So Two things that we have to keep in mind, that we have to understand in the context of society during that time. One, she is legally married. She's somebody's wife. 
And therefore, when it comes to expected standards to follow in the interaction with the other, with, with men, she has more freedom. She's granted more freedom, especially for a woman of the upper classes. A married woman of the upper classes can be with a man without supervision and can be with the man who is flirting with her. In fact, a certain amount of light flirting, flirting banter is expected in, uh, uh, during parties, in, in social mixers, in this kind of society. Okay, so keep that in mind, it's very important. Morality is, is a strong factor in these films. And um, so, what is that I was about to add? So, it is not scandalous for her to be as she will be on the road with Peter without a chaperone, okay? Because she, technically, she is married. However, we know, we learn from here that she was snatched from her husband right after they were declared man and wife, and therefore, she's still pure, okay? So, she's been married, but she's still pure, so she's in between. She's not completely innocent, because technically she's married, so she shouldn't be the first choice of a proper man. However, this film, remember what I said about the connection between psychology and the movie industry in the US, this film, like many others in, uh, during this era, the 1930s, and one of the readings talks about it, is about second chances. It's about healing. The healing here is that she made a mistake. She married the wrong man just to run away from her husband, from her father. And because this guy, uh, looks like a big guy, a big hero, because he flies planes, right? But of course, he's empty inside, not a real man. She is given a second chance when he, she meets Peter on the road, this journalist. And of course, by the end of the movie, they, the, the first marriage will be annulled, and they will get a marriage, obtain a marriage license. Healing, of course, applies to the other character as well, right? So in many ways, it appears that this film is a traditional film, the man saving the woman, but the woman saving the man in turn, or both going through a journey, a physical journey, but also a journey of redemption, right? And he, we will see him being a drunk, being uh, someone who doesn't have the proper professional ethics at the beginning of this film. And through the encounter with him, he will experience this kind of healing himself. Okay, so she's married. We know this much and we know a little bit. We know his father is trying to have the marriage annulled but he's powerless at this point. And we see that the crew on board, the waiters are scared of her, okay? So again, she's not respectful. She doesn't respect any authority or anyone else for that matter. But it's clear that this kind of interaction can only exist within the yacht, that this would not be acceptable in the real world. So what? What is the twist after the first couple of minutes, after the setup? She has to leave the yacht, right? And venture into the world and experience and be tested by the world. His father tries the manly way. She slaps her. And she responds the way she knows how to. Of course, she doesn't yield to authority. So she turns, she opens the window, she jumps out of the boat, she swims away, and there she is in the real world with very little money, 
nothing. In fact, she has some clothes, etc. We don't, we don't even know where she got them or where she got the money because she jumped into the water. Forget about this. So she wants to take the night bus because it, she, it's the cheapest way to go to New York because in New York she can find Mr. King, her husband, and finally they can consummate the marriage, right? And once they consummate the marriage, the father really cannot do anything because at that point she would be spoiled goods, okay? And this is the first test. She's out and in an environment where she never learned how to be independent, on top of that, the father has already sent out detectives to find her, and the detectives are checking train stations, bus stations, etc. But this is the dialogue between the two detectives. Again, nothing is thrown away in this film. Everything is meaningful. One says to the other, can you imagine Ellie Andrews, <coughs> the spoiled brat, the daughter of a millionaire, always assisted by servants, riding on a bus, right? Meaning she's not equipped to face a real life situation. So this is still part of the setup in a way that you know what to expect. The twist has already happened, she's in the world, but in case you missed it, Hollywood always does that, multiple prompts, multiple cues, in case you missed it, you're reminded as a viewer that something will go wrong. The first test, she passes with flying colors because instead of going to buy the ticket herself, the detectives are observing the window where you buy the tickets, she sends an old woman to buy a ticket to New York, from Florence to New York, and give it to her. So first test in the real world, she passes. She can escape the surveillance of the detectives. Now we introduce the main protagonist. This is Peter Warren. He's a journalist, but right now is drunk as a skunk. Uh, can you say that? I don't know. Sometimes <laughs> I, I pick expressions in English. Forgive me. I'm not a native speaker. And he's surrounded by a court of drunkards. So certainly not the most outstanding member of society. He's on the phone with the editor of his newspaper, and he's being fired for a proper cause. The newspaper editor is saying that they, he's costing them too much money because they have to pay him for to, to be out and, and collect material and then write articles, but these articles are not written in the proper style, right? They're talking about the style that is not a professional style. So, he's unemployed, he's drunk, okay? So, again, she's in need of correction, apparently, or a lesson, what is the real world? He's in need of correction, right? What is working really professionally for a journal? And in need of redemption and healing because he's a drunk, and an aggressive drunk, of course. So, we see him come out, with surrounded by his uh, uh, buffoon admirers, right? There he is at the very center. And he gets onto the bus. He also has to go back to New York because he was apparently in Florida to do some work, but now has to go back to New York where he lives and where he's hoping perhaps to find a job gets onto the night, night bus, but the only places that are available are the, the, this small bench at the back, which is full of newspaper that the bus is carrying uh, to deliver them along the way, okay? So very ironic, right? He's a journalist, he finds seats occupied by newspaper. What is his reaction at this point in the film to show that he's not a proper, that doesn't have professional integrity? takes the newspapers, which are the means of his sustenance, right, as a journalist, throw them, throws them out of the window of the bus to make room for uh, 
himself. Okay? And he gets into an argument with the driver. Of course, the driver is, is angry. <laughs> and anyway, they almost get to punch each other, but it doesn't happen. Meanwhile, she gets on the bus while the two men are arguing and sits where he wanted to sit. So he goes back and says, but that upon which you sit is mine, which is part of the farce. A farce is an extreme comedy. Uh, farcical comedy is, is really not the highest, the most highbrow form of comedy. Because there is a double entendre, right? There is a hidden meaning in this line, right? And in fact, you read it in her face. She's surprised. What are you saying? What is it? That upon which you sit is mine. What is that? What is he talking about? What are the two interpretations that conflict and create this farcical comedy? Don't make me say it. You have to say it. Is he talking about the bench? Yes and no. What is he talking about? Say it out loud. It begins with... Her butt. What? Her butt. Her butt. Her ass. Exactly. I was about to say it begins with an A. Okay? Your ass is mine. Which, which is the kind of comedy and the kind of twists that you find in here. As I said, Capra is feel good, but he also has this kind of zing in, in his films, okay? It is this kind of comedy, and it's a bit risque in the language and in some of the situations, risque by the standards of the time, right? This is the first indication that it is so, this kind of line, okay? The bench is mine, your ass is mine. Okay, I said it now. And... There they are, because the bench is so small, it's not really two seats. And this is one of the fundamental features in a road movie, forced proximity. A road romance is based on the fact that two strangers, in this case a man and a woman, who are opposites, who are not compatible at all, who appears to be hostile to each other and hate each other's guts, are forced to share a very small space inside a vehicle, and that forced physical and mental, psychological proximity, of course, generates not a relationship. It generates first a mutual change, right? They influence each other. They spend time, they're forced to spend time, and by the time they've spent enough time in this kind of situation, they're not the same people. And that's how they, they, they get together. Okay? Not that they have to tolerate or get to know each other. No, they change each other. That's one of the features of a world movie genre. So it's a very long trip from Florida to New York on a night bus that is probably traveling 30 miles per hour. And they stop several times. And every time is like another chapter or segment in the story. And every time is a new experience or a new test for either of the characters or both. So first they stop to have hot dogs. Of course, she doesn't have a lot of money and she's not the kind of girl to have hot dogs. So she stands by the bus and she has her luggage, you don't see it here because of the lights and the projector, but she has her luggage here. So second test, she passed, or, or third if you want, she passed the first test, evading the detectives. She passed the second test, getting a seat uh, on, on the bus and holding on to it. She refuses to, when she said, this seat is mine, uh, he, she, she doesn't move. Third test, she starts to fail. Right? Because after all, we know she's not equipped to face crisis in the real world. A man comes, and again, I think the man is here, but, and, and if you look at, at the 
frame in the, your computer, you will say someone comes and takes, grabs her luggage. And so uh, she doesn't have her things. Maybe some of her money is gone as well. Okay, so we know that she needs someone to protect her, that her independence is very frail. And Clark Gable, Peter, tries to rescue her stuff, but he cannot catch the thief. And she's not particularly grateful or interested. In fact, after they get on the bus again, this time, he's surprised to see that she, of course, every stop, some of the passengers get out. Not all the passengers go all the way to New York. So she finds an empty seat, okay? So new chapter, new experience. She doesn't want to have anything to do with him. She sits next to a real man. But that is another test that she cannot handle. Because sitting next to someone else is not more freedom for her because uh, the, the big guy, the fat guy, ends up sleeping on her and, and pressing on her. So even, even worse, she has to acknowledge that Peter provided a better kind of situation. She gets up, she goes back to him, and she's forced to take his arm. So again, the forced physical contact, again, allowed by the moral codes for a married wife, would have been inappropriate if she had not been married, even though she's not completely married because she hasn't consummated the marriage. Another stop, breakfast, 30 minutes. And now look at the situation. Something has happened here. He's not drunk anymore. And he, who doesn't know yet, she is Ellie Andrews. And therefore, she has the potential for a story he can sell as a journalist. So completely without any self-interest, he is taking care of her. And you can see it visually. In the mise-en-scene, she has his scarf around her neck. She has his raincoat on her body and her lap. So not only she's grabbing, holding on to him, but he is taking care of her properly, right? And without, he's not even in love, right? He's not trying to take advantage of her. So they stop. And she says, OK, I'll go to the Windsor Hotel. Because she says rich, so she, she cannot go to a hot dog kiosk or a bathroom in, in the bus station. She'll go to the Windsor Hotel. He says, you'll never make it in time. The bus will leave. And of course, she's spoiled brat, in need of education, in need of correction, and she doesn't care. OK? OK, so she fills another test. There she is. She comes back. She's 20 minutes late. The bus has left. He is taking care of her. But at this point, he knows. You see the newspaper? He knows who she is. And so not only he has waited for her, but he has the ticket, the bus ticket that she, not being able to be completely independent, left on the seat of the bus. So without him, she would be completely lost. And he is more and more taking care of her. Here is your ticket, OK? And it says, your father will stop you before you get halfway to New York, meaning you, you cannot keep up with this game. You cannot evade capture by the detectives. At this point, he has learned everything about her from the newspapers. And he has an interest about this, right? But he pretends. Another thing you find over and over again in road movies, he pretends to be someone else. He doesn't tell her that he's a journalist. He pretends to be someone like he was before reading that newspaper, who is simply interested in her as another human being in need of help, and takes this as an opportunity to teach her a lesson, because she says, OK, yes, it's true. I'm the daughter of millionaire, big millionaire. Andrews, however, I'll give you money. Don't 
report me, don't tell anyone who I am, and when we get to New York, I'll give you money. And he says, oh, you, you're used to buying people. You cannot buy me, okay? So it's a lesson he teaches her, but it's a lesson he's learning himself, right? He has to have the power to refuse money from someone who's far more richer, far richer than he is, okay? Let me find all the language there. He goes to the tele telegraph office and he sends a telegram to his editor saying, I have a story for you. Boy, do I have a hot story for you, okay? The editor will reject that telegram. He doesn't trust Peter Andrews. Peter Andrews is in need of redemption, even with a hot story in his hands, cannot gain the trust, cannot gain back the trust of his editor, right? He has not completed his journey of redemption. He cannot present himself again into the real world of journalism, right? So first attempt, but he continues to follow her because she thinks that he'll write the story, that this will come out right. Go back, they go back on the bus. Once again, she keeps by herself. She tries, once again, to be independent without him. Ends up next to this guy, uh, beautifully played by an actor from that time, Mr. Shapley. And Mr. Shapley himself is playing a pretend game. He's married, we learn, lives in New Jersey, has two kids, young kids. He's a family man, but he's flirting heavily with her. And she calls her, Peter had called her a brat, he calls her mama. And then later on, Peter will call her a dame. So little by little, the erotic influence, the erotic effect she can have on men come out, right? And again, so he is very insistent with her, right? And she defends herself. She's not completely powerless, right? So she's learning in a, in a, in a way. So she, she is so strong in this interaction that Shapley has to say, looks like you're one up on me, meaning you're smarter than I am at this game. Yet, in spite of this, in spite of the fact that she's not exactly in need of help here, he intervenes. Again, keep in mind, there are traditional gender roles, but they're also made fun of or questioned in some ways. For example, in here, because we know that the intervention by him is not exactly indispensable, okay? But he, Peter, has to pretend he's that kind of man with her, right? And little by little, he realized that it's not that, that he's not up to that role, okay? So he says, can I sit next to my wife? And of course, Shaley says, oh, okay, I'm sorry, uh, guy, uh, I'll, I'll sit somewhere else. And once again, they're sitting together. She thanks him, this time she's sincere. So they're warming up to each other and he plays the part of the husband, right? Because now they're pretending to be husband and wife. So how do you play the husband in a traditional model of the dynamics between the husband and the wife? The husband has the power, power which can be authority. I give the orders, I decide, or force. I can defend you, or I can hold you, right? And the woman has influence. She can manipulate others. She can use her seduction, etc. So she wants chocolates. And uh, there is a, a guy selling the snacks on the bus, and he says, no, 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 she's not getting them. He takes over, he decides because he's the husband, but also teaches her a lesson in thriftiness because he tells her uh, the, the chocolates are, I don't know, a couple of dollars, 
and you only have four dollars. So you're still very far away from New York City. You'll never get there with four dollars if you spend half of your money or a third of your money on a box of chocolate. Okay? But again, keep in mind that this representation of traditional roles is also layered with irony. Okay? Don't go too heavy on that. So there is a problem with the road. A bridge has been taken away by the water. They have to stop along the way. And this is the first of three times they will spend the night together. And notice, of course you cannot see it because of the projector. Notice that before we heard that she has four dollars, that she has very little money left. In fact, maybe she has less than four dollars. And the night, a night at the auto camp, this 1930s road motel is two dollars. Basically, she doesn't have enough to rent a cabin by herself. We, we know that from the lines. So, what are the options? She's outside in the rain with his raincoat, but she's outside in the rain. She has to be independent, protect her honor, right? But he is in the cabin and he says, Oh, come on, get inside, right? And there she is. She's inside, but next to the door, I can live, I can run away if you jump at me. And he prepares for bed. He says, okay, this will be your bed. I'll sleep. And again, he's taking care of her, playing the husband, right? But he's not doing it for love. So it's a pretend game. It's a representation of traditional roles. And he comes up with this idea of the wall of Jericho. Jericho is a town in the Old Testament. The Israelites come to attack the town. The town is surrounded by walls. They cannot get in. And then a Jewish general uh, endowed of this power by God simply plays a trumpet and the sound of the trumpet makes the walls crumble and the Israelites can invade the city. So he puts up this rope and a blanket to separate to the two sides of the room, give her privacy. Okay. She falls on the walls of Jericho. But then she's not moving. And here you find another of several situations that are a bit risque, that play with the tropes. She's not moving to her side of the room, so instead, this time, notice, instead of playing the husband and saying, you, woman, go to your side, she gets what he wants by playing games with her. Says, okay, this is my side, so I'm undressing. And let's see how long you can resist. He never says, go to your side, but at some point, takes off the jacket, the tie, the shirt, and he has nothing underneath. And since this movie got five Oscars, became very popular, you know what happened in your city? Men stopped buying T-shirts. But men saw this and says, oh, I want to be like Clara Gable, which is like saying I want to be like George Clooney 20 years ago. So I'm not going to buy a T-shirt that's better uh, and, and women won't like me. And it really happened. For a few years, uh, the sales of T-shirts went down. Then he takes the shoes off. Then he's about to unbutton his pants. That's when she, she goes to her side. Something else happens here, which is more subtle. You may not notice it, but there is a kind of comedy a la Larry David or Seinfeld at work through this movie, and this is the first incident of that. Now... If you know nothing about Jerry Seinfeld, leave this room now. I will not hold it against you and help you withdraw from the class. So, Jerry Seinfeld is based very much because of the mind of Larry David, who might have well have learned the lesson for these kinds of movies, on the encyclopedic knowledge of trifles. That is to say, 
the, the most famous line from the Seinfeld sitcom is, this sitcom is about nothing, right? Bunch of characters, George, Jerry, Elaine, Kramer, who have nothing really or not much going on in their lives. However, the smallest things become epic, legendary. And one of the recurring features in Seinfeld is that a character, not just Jerry, but especially Jerry, but sometimes also George, and a few times Kramer, will try to explain something as simple as, how do you take your dessert? Or some other trivial routine, but they'll come up with a philosophy of this, an elaborate network of notions, right? Elaborating on this. In this case, he's doing this with undressing. He's not just undressing to push her to the side of the room, but he's explaining how to undress. And he's doing it with pretend knowledge that seems to be deep about this. But again, it's a game. It's irony. It's comedy, right? Because it's undressing, but he's explaining that as if he were a philosophy professor or a biology professor. Okay, and this will come back a few more times. So she goes to the other side, and now she has, she, she has, he gives her a pair of his pajamas. But notice what happens in here. She he is in bed, she's undressing, and the faint white spot you see here is her lingerie when she is getting naked, instead of putting it away, she puts it across the wall, and this is already something slightly erotic by the standards of the time, right? Signifying there is only this blanket between a man and a naked woman, or almost naked woman, but in case you miss this, the film provides another cue whereby he says, well, maybe you could take that out of the wall of walls of Jericho, meaning otherwise I don't know if I'll be able to resist, okay? Let me, give me a couple of minutes and then I'll stop. So you know at this point it's kind of a development, right? You know at this point not only they've had physical proximity, but there is a hint of sexual tension her fear, but then also her unintentional seductive move. I'll put the last thing on my body where you can see it, so you know I'm naked. You cannot have me, but you know I'm naked. She wakes up, she's happy, she's rested. She's, trying, she's beginning to enjoy being taken care of. Again, but he's not taking care of her because he's in love with her. He's not a proper companion. He's the journalist who has to take her to New York and write the story. Keep that in mind. And she wakes up. He's not there, but he went to the village. He's again taking care of her for the wrong reasons, right? Lots of bags, things. So what's going on? What has he, what has he done? First of all, he got her since she has no luggage. Colgate toothpaste and a toothbrush from the local pharmacy, the local drugstore. Then he had her dress pressed. She has to appear proper in public, right? She cannot go out with a wrinkle get a dress. And however, he plays the part of the authoritative husband saying, you have to get out of bed. You're not in your villa. You're not in your mansion where you can wake up and get up whenever you want, as late as you want. So he says, you have to get up, and if you don't, I'll come and get you out of the bed. And she responds. This time she responds to authority, although it's a mockery, it's a game. Right, I'm out, I'm out. And, of course, she has to wash that. The showers are outside. So another test. She ventures outside in the real world, but She's very exposed, right? And again, 
it's clear that she would like to have help. And it's clear that he's not exactly taking care of her in that sense. So instead of telling her, go out and get a shower, he starts flirting with her because he knows that she, can, she cannot stand it. Again, it's a pretend. It's all game. It's all pretending. It's all role playing. Up to the point where she says, okay, okay, to avoid this kind of flirtation, she goes out and she's exposed to the gaze of other people, right? You see here, people looking at her go by, right? She, she has her pajamas and a robe or, or his raincoat on top of her. So she's not as strong as she could be as the character of the heiress. And over and over again, you see her walking and being watched by multiple people. This is where I'll stop. Thank you for your patience. If you need to talk to me, I'll come here and I'll be going to my office uh, soon after I get my stuff, okay?